intimidated too. Well, I've just opened the doors, so we'll uh, we'll let the room fill up. We do have a big branch here. It's um, mm-hmm. around 450. We've had more, but because of COVID, the numbers have dropped off a little bit. Um, but it's still a very, very big branch. Keeps us very mm-hmm. busy, doesn't it, Ruth? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was just checking the, the people coming in. Okay. Mm-hmm. How Hi, many everybody. are there? Sorry, John. No, not at all. I was just wondering of the of the, the, the membership, what the makeup is or division between um, um, kind of retired diplomats, academics, local business people. What? Um, yes, we're. It's actually pretty diverse. Um, we have every everyone from young students at Royal Roads who are um, from India and now studying here to mm. many diplomats um, of that 450 plus, I'd say about a hundred uh, are students uh, from all over the island. Uh, it's, it's a pretty diverse group of people. Mm. So I see the room is filling up here. Well, that's good. Um, 301, why don't, we, uh, why don't we kick off Ruth? Absolutely. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Hello everyone and thank you so much for taking the time to be part of today's session. Um, Welcome to all our Canadian International Council members and guests. We're happy to have you here today uh, for this Foreign Policy by Canadians event. My name is Ruth Mujib and I'm a member of the Executive Committee of the Canadian International Council Victoria Branch here on Vancouver Island. Before we get things started today, it's important to recognize that the CIC Victoria, um, that CIC Victoria members live, work, and learn on the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and gratefully acknowledge the coastal nations on whose traditional territories we meet together. For those not familiar with the Canadian International Council, we are an independent, nonpartisan, membership driven think tank with the express mandate to engage Canadians on international affairs and promote a, a deeper understanding of Canada's role in a changing international landscape. What makes us different from many think tanks is that we have branches in 17 Canadian cities with some 1,400 members who are deeply involved with and interested in Canada's role in the world. You can find out more about us by Googling the Canadian International Council, where you can also find our CIC Victoria page. Today, this event has been structured as a conversation between the president of CIC Victoria, Chris Kilford, and John, followed by an audience Q&A portion. And for this portion, please use the Q&A function and we will do our best to get to all of them. We're also recording this event. John, we're very, very pleased to have you here with us today. And for the benefit of our audience, I would like to just mention that John is a national best-selling author and one of Canada's leading voices on innovation and economic disruption. Since 2014, he has served as senior vice president in the office of the CEO at Royal Bank of Canada, leading the organization's research and thought leadership on economic, technological, and social change. Previously, he was editor-in-chief of the Globe and Mail, an editor of reports on business, and for most of the 1990s, a foreign correspondent for the newspaper in Asia. He's also a senior fellow at the C.D. Howe Institute and the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and and Public Policy, an author of three previous books, Out of Poverty and Into Something More Comfortable, Timbit Nation, A Hitchhiker's View of Canada, Mass Disruption, 30 Years on the Front Lines of a Media Revolution. Today, we're here to talk about your latest book, Planet Canada, How Experts Are Changing the World in which you argue that our country's greatest untapped international resource may be the millions of Canadians who don't live here. And this is a grave error for a small country whose voice is getting lost behind developing nations 
whose influence is rapidly in increasing. And now I will hand over to Chris. Thank you so much for being here today, John. Thank you, Ruth, and uh, welcome, uh, John, and welcome to everybody that's uh, joining us today. How are you in Toronto? Uh, well, we had a bit of sunshine today, so uh, very, very happy for that. But um, you know, like like everyone, I'm sure everywhere, the challenges of this uh, pandemic are, are are relentless, and we're among the lucky ones on the planet. I remind myself every day, uh, but it's. Um, you know, it's taking a toll on all of us. So great to be able to spend time with uh, uh, with such an inspiring group. Well, we're, we're glad to have you here. And I do have my uh, copy of Planet Canada, which you can see behind me. And uh, it, it's, it, as Ruth said, it's one of, um, it's one of four books that, that you've written. And I took a look at uh, a few of them online uh, recently, and of course, bought the latest one. And, and for those that, um, I haven't perhaps looked at all of your books. The, the first one, um, Out of Poverty and Into Something More Comfortable, came out in May of 2001, uh, before the events of uh, September 9 and 11. And that one documented your travels around the world in the developing world. And then, of course, Timbit Nation came out a few years after that. And that's where you went across Canada um, and, and looked at us. Then to mass disruption in 2015, where we uh, where you focused on the media, and it's something that we can come back to afterwards if we have time. But I'd like now to just move to Planet Canada, your fourth yeah. book, and what were the motivations behind uh, you deciding that you were going to to tackle this particular subject of expats around the world? Yeah, thanks. Uh, th thanks for the conversation. Um, I got going on this topic when I lived in India in the in the 1990s. I was a foreign correspondent for the Globe and Mail, uh, and Delhi was home, but I traveled all over Asia and Africa, uh, and was always struck by meeting Canadians in the unlikeliest of places doing often the unlikeliest of things. Some were up to no good. Uh, I covered the Briac scandal in uh, in 97, but, uh, but most of them were doing uh, pretty extraordinary work. And no one in Canada seemed to know about it. That stuck with me after I moved back and, and became an editor at The Globe. Uh, but what really um, got me thinking differently was when the federal government, the Harper government, started to pull back uh, on the rights and privileges of Canadians overseas. Uh, and a lot of this came out of 9-11. It was a security concern. There was a, a more small C conservative approach in the West to notions of citizenship. And we had been pioneers globally in citizenship, including dual citizenship, uh, which I get uh, in the book. And I thought this is, okay, kind of situationally understandable and strategically unwise. Uh, because we need those people who I met out there and we cannot be sort of uh, cutting the sinews, the, 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 the tissues of, uh, of, of connection. Uh, so we railed about it a bit in the globe. And uh, uh, after I left the globe, I, I embarked on a research project at the Monk School at U of T and started to document, do a bit more of the a survey work on uh, how big this community was and was pretty confident in saying it was, you know, it's at least 2 million. Uh, and that's been a debated point. And, and, and the, 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 the bit that sealed it for me was I got Facebook to run um, th through their own uh, data, how many Canadians are on Facebook outside of Canada. And it was 1.8, 1.9 million. Uh, <laughs> well, if that's, um, um, you know, if that was, if that's what Facebook has found, down, then that gives me confidence in saying this is at least two million, maybe three million, but at least two million. Uh, so that that led me to the book of trying to inspire Canadians to, to recognize this this community, which I call our eleventh province. Uh, tell lots of personal stories, uh, stories of individuals. Uh, hope young people read it, and a lot have been reaching out to me to say they are reading it and really inspired because I think that's key for our country. We got people have to leave. Uh, we don't travel enough. We don't move abroad enough. Uh, we can talk about the merits of, uh, of of that, but also help us think strategically about this population, uh, not just 
maintaining the rights and privileges, but actually finding ways to get them to work for the greater good of Canada and a world that, that, that Canada needs. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, in the book, you you look at some of the historical examples and uh, mm -hmm. and then the more recent historical examples. One of the names that uh, that jumped out at me right away is uh, Dashan, big mountain in China. Mark Rosewell, who went there in the 1980s. Well, you probably know that's Ben Rosewell's brother, our mm -hmm. president of CIC. Yeah. Um, and when he speaks Mandarin, you would not know that if you weren't looking at him, you would think it was uh, somebody that was born and raised in, in, in China. Um, one of the other issues or things you raise is, uh, is Tim Hortons, uh, where you look for these cultural markers. And I was in Oman last year around this time in Muscat, and there was a, there was a Tim Hortons. And so my wife and I had to go. And, and, and in your book, you know, you, you talk about people posting photos of themselves at Tim Hortons around the world. And I did that too on Facebook. Um, mm. But it was so um, good to see something Canadian, although I know people will argue Tim Hortons is now owned uh, by folks outside of the country. But, but you do talk about the 11th province and 2.8 million people. Uh, you speak about uh, Robert Greenhill, who runs uh, Global Canada. Um, Monty Hall and Peter Jennings is historical folks from days past and Kamel Sadu and Mike Myers and many of the world's renowned tech experts, doctors and filmmakers. I think what your book really brings out is how many of these people are actually out there. I mean, was it a surprise to you when you embarked on this journey? Yeah, and, and, and it, it, the project ended up, I, I did most of it, uh, while I'm working at RBC, so nights and weekends and vacations over over five years. But every time I would interview someone, they would say, here's 10 more people you have to interview. These, and, and sure enough, I would find them and think, this is extraordinary. Why has no one heard this story? And then they would introduce me to more people. And it just, the, the, the research <laughs> became exhausted uh, and would, literally never would have ended. So I finally had to just... Um, draw a line in the sand and say that uh, there's only so many Canadians I can put into the, uh, in, into the book. But it, uh, it really impressed me how, you know, we know the celebrities, uh, but how many Canadians are in leading positions in organizations, companies, communities uh, around the world. And it isn't because they have fled Canada. Uh, it, it takes a special something to be a Canadian expat because you are not driven away by scarcity, except maybe scarcity of opportunity. Uh, you're, you're drawn to opportunity elsewhere. But this is you know, one of the world's great countries to live in. I think we can agree on that. So mm -hmm. why would you leave? Uh, right. And I wanted to understand from these, uh, these people why, okay, wanting to be on a world stage, uh, yes, but why leave and stay away? And there are lots of reasons for that. But I think what we've lost sight of as a country is they want to stay connected. They truly feel Canadian. And we'll, we'll say, you know, I may have been gone 20, 30 years. I'm as Canadian as the day I left. And I want to be part of the country. Uh, and if there's any sort of core argument in the book, well, the core argument is we're living in a, 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 an age of networks um, more than institutions. And we're living in an age, <laughs> the, the pandemic has brought this home, literally, uh, that can transcend geography. So how do we think about citizenship kind of in a, uh, an age, I don't want to overstate this, but in an age that is not as geographically defined? Uh, and that's, I, I think, a great kind of opportunity for Canadian foreign policy thinkers to think about what does citizenship mean in the digital age? What does... What does uh, connection to country mean beyond being standing on the soil of, of Canada? Yeah, I think uh, one of the mo more disheartening things I, I kind of caught in the book as a theme was uh, how many of the people you spoke to, uh, they were unanimously uh, agreeing that they felt in many ways disconnected, that, that no one was reaching out. Uh, yeah. And, and you talk about, um, 
you know, how do you change that? You talk about this. So how, how do you, how do you, with this army of expats that are scattered around the world, this 11th province, um, how do you actually do anything to, to address that and get them, bring them closer to home? So we've got to take a page from old world thinking and a page from new world thinking. Old world, th world thinking around diaspora diplomacy is, and I get into this in the book, is really fascinating. I read a lot of history for this section. Uh, and it started with largely with European countries as they were losing 100 years ago, masses of people uh, to, North, to, to North America. Uh, and they uh, sometimes were driven out, but largely it was just an economic opportunity. Uh, countries from Germany to Ukraine to uh, Britain wanted to maintain their connection with the diaspora. And it was partly for political reasons. They didn't want revolutions being fomented from the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the housing projects of New York City, uh, in, in the case of Ireland, uh, or maybe they did, uh, but also for economic ties and for influence in the, in the new world. And so the Italians were the best at this. They set up Italian clubs around the world 100 years ago in Argentina, in Canada, uh, uh, which continue to this day of funding clubs and newspapers and cultural exchanges because it increased Italy's influence uh, among other countries. And they, they, they were thinking so strategically. So we have to think that way. How do we use our expats in these different countries? Not to lobby on behalf of a specific need, although maybe you do that sometimes, but just to maintain that, that presence that strategic presence. And the new world thinking is, is to use digital networks uh, to, to activate uh, these populations. And for that, I, I, I love to cite the cases of Singapore and Israel, um, which use small power thinking. And I think sometimes Canada gets stuck, we get bogged down in middle power thinking. And sometimes it's better to be a small power because you can move more nimbly, you can move between alliances, you're more agile. And we need a bit of that small power thinking with our expats, the way Singapore and Israel do, where they're, they're no longer trying to bring them back. They know they're not going to come back. Some might, most won't. But they know they can be used effectively, especially in a tech-minded uh, uh, world. So... Uh, Singapore and Israel both have sort of activate, nourish, and stay in touch with these networks, but bring them back uh, for business reasons, get them investing back in the country, but also force their own countries to connect, or their, their own companies, I'm sorry, to connect with this ex expat network. And I think this is a big opportunity for Canada. The C100 in Silicon Valley is a great model, but we need to replicate that all over the world. Where Canadian companies, if you're thinking of doing business in Dubai or Beirut or Hong Kong, should be reaching out to networks of Canadians there, along with other networks. But that's our kind of uh, special power to learn from them. Uh, they're like a, a free consulting service in some ways, if we want them to be, but also uh, to get into, the, into, into their networks. Yeah, you mentioned the, the Italian example. Um, so people have, you know, people come here for opportunity, but they're often escaping either wars or poor mm. economic situations. And in the Canadian context, we're not really escaping anything. Perhaps, as you say in the book, um, this desire for American moxie grips people and they want to get out there for the opportunities. Um, but we don't have that same compelling uh, need, you know, when Canadians go abroad, there's no need to gather together. I mean, we find a lot of diasporas here gather together. We just saw the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. You get the Azerbaijanian mm -hmm. and Armenian diasporas gathering together because there's a crisis in their own country. We don't have that that would mm -hmm. naturally draw people together. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it would be it would be a bit of a challenge. And I I I wanted to ask you, you know. You do talk about countries like Ireland who do a much better job than Canada does in, in reaching out to their expat populations. But we also see some um, pretty ominous cases where perhaps China 
uh, its involvement with the diaspora and so forth. And I, I just wondered if, if we did go down the road of, um, of trying to gather in that expat community, would be would be be running the risk of, of, of politicizing folks. Yeah, that is a risk, but it's but it can be it's a manageable risk, and therefore not a reason not to to uh, to pursue this to pursue this course. Uh, and I, I, I'm concerned that our um, uh, that uh, there's hesitation in the bureaucracy to be more ambitious in the space for a number of reasons, but that's one of the big reasons. And I, I've heard it cited, we can't do this, we can't keep lists because of privacy reasons, we can't have people feel like we're surveying them the way China does with its expats uh, here or its diaspora. Uh, and I think that's a bit of a false, uh, a fair but, but usually false concern. Uh, and certainly when I mention this to expats, they say, what? Like, I want them to know who I am uh, and I want them to contact me. Uh, so you can have opt-in models. There's, there's, there's ways of getting, getting around, uh, around this. And we do it in kind of ad hoc ways, smart ambassadors and high commissioners and trade commissioners. Maybe some are on this uh, call who I've known over the years. We're outstanding at this. In different uh, in different communities, uh, and many of them just took it upon themselves uh, in their own mission, literally made it their mission, which is how the C100 was created in Silicon Valley. Stuart Beck, uh, who was Consul General in San Francisco at the time in 2010, and his trade commissioner brought the expats together, and 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 they created the C100. But then I'll just wrap up with this point. It, 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 there's a really interesting insight, which I tr try to get at in the chapter on the C100. The, the, the culture between diplomatic corps and expats sometimes are antithetical, or at least they don't have perfect harmony. Expats tend to be, um, uh, they, they can be rebellious, that's why they left. Uh, they're individualistic. This is more so in places like Silicon Valley. Uh, they're not process-minded, so you can <laughs> imagine the comparisons. And the expats who founded the C100 um, uh, had great stories uh, that they shared with me about their initial meetings, literally walking out on the Canadian diplomats and saying, like, no chance are we <laughs> going to develop an organization with those folks. They are so bureaucratic. Like, let's not waste our time here. But the bureaucrats, including Stuart Beck, stayed at it, helped find common ground, a great Canadian secret sauce. And on that common ground, the C-100 was, uh, was, uh, was built. So we can't get in our way. We have to find these common grounds to build, uh, build this because we need it as a country. And so just one additional final point, because I want to challenge your point that we don't have crises here that, that force expats to gather. Well, actually we do, um, but they're very different. And COVID has been a great example. There are Canadians, leaders in their fields, in the WHO, in health organizations around the world, and they include John Bell, one of the world's leading immunologists at, um, at uh, Oxford University, Sir John Bell, who would love to help Canada in this. So why in this situation, and if we had a proper system, are we not able to say, let's form an expat advisory council, uh, maybe pull together the half dozen Canadians who are totally plugged in out there in the world to advise the health minister or the prime minister on what we're doing. And you can multiply that opportunity across the board. You've been speaking to a question that ties into a, a question I have from Hugh Stevens, a colleague of mine here in Victoria. Um, and it's really focused on the embassies. You know, we know we have chambers of commerce and business groups uh, in various uh, cities and so forth around the world. Um, you know, is, is, is there a role? Uh, I mean, there is, must be a role for embassies to, to be doing this. As, although you say it's been challenging at, at times, and I'm, I'm wondering in your travels, if you um, 
came across places, countries where we have embassies or partic in particular expat communities that are actually doing quite well. That relationship um, is, is doing well. So were there any particular cases where you saw that we were creating the conditions that you would like to see us do worldwide? Yeah, it's such a great uh, question, Hugh, because it it because it because it, 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 it reveals the opportunity, uh, an easy opportunity, um, which is to better fund our missions, to entertain, for lack of a better word, but to strategically network um, with uh, with expats and to use our facilities to let the expats strategically network, and in that kind of um, short-term cheap that, uh, that can curse uh, Canada. We've cut back on that. Uh, one of my monk school uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Deanna Horton, has written a, uh, an op-ed on this, uh, citing my book, but making the case for the restoration of essentially entertainment budgets for missions. And you might think, well, that's kind of a frivolous uh, idea. Not, not at all. That is actually the best dollars you can spend. And he, as Canadians, we just got to get 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 over it. Canada House in uh, in in London is an outstanding example of this, where our facilities is you know just extraordinary, as probably many of you know. And we should not shortchange the ability of the staff there to use that facility, but to help expats use it when there is an expat like Mark Carney there. Say, well, Governor Carney. Maybe you don't want to host your di your, your your dinner at uh, the Bank of England. Why not host it at Canada House? And you know we'll we'll serve whatever you want. On and on. Or Stephen Toop, you know, who's now at uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor at Cambridge University, one of the leaders in uh, in academia in the world, former head of uh, UBC and the Monk School, who I write about in the book. Uh, we had a great series of conversations in Cambridge. You know, give him Canada House. Say Stephen. Host, you know, we'll foot the bill. Bring together Canadians and, and world academics or, or John Bell at Oxford. You come to Canada House to help solve the COVID crisis and don't worry about the cost because that's what the Israelis would do. That's what the Singaporeans would do. But it's also what the Italians and others uh, uh, tend to do. So good, good opportunity there. Um, Everyone loves Canada House, um, but uh, you know missions in, in 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 Paris, but also Los Angeles have been really uh, really effective as a as a hub for uh, for uh, for expats. Yeah, you, you spoke about entertainment budgets. I when I was the defense attaché in in Ankara, Turkey, we would get our annual allocation for uh, in home entertainment. You know, to have people come over and you would look at it and go, "What? That's even less than last year." Um, and you would cut corners and do what you, you needed to do. But um, that's another issue. Um, I had a question that came in earlier today from uh, Roger Finnan here in Victoria, who you met in uh, India some 20 years ago when he was the regional director of the IDRC. And um, he wanted to ask you, building on the book's message and, and influencing policymakers back home, how, how can we as individually back home, what can we do to, to, to press the Canadian government to really look at this issue? I mean, CIC in some respects can, can do that. And I want to bring in a lot of what you've got into the book to the foreign policy by Canadians work we're doing. So that's a start. But what else mm. could we be doing back here? Yeah, well, thank, thanks for the question, Roger, and so happy to hear from you. I hope uh, you're well. I'm, I'm eternally uh, indebted to Roger for letting me um, use the IDRC office in uh, the summer of, uh, uh, what was it, um, uh, 1999, to write uh, out, out of Poverty, my first, uh, my first book. Uh, so thank you, Roger, for, for that. Um, well, please do exactly that help the, both the bureaucracy and the political uh, class understand the strategic value of, uh, of, of an expat strategy. There's a lot of interest in, in this in Ottawa. I had a, uh, Stu Beck and I uh, had a great session with uh, Global Affairs a couple of weeks ago. 
And you know, Christian Freeland is uh, a former expat and very interested uh, in in this. And uh, uh, Francois Philippe Champagne, uh, an, another uh, former expat. So I think this government gets it. Of course, they've got way bigger challenges on their plate right now. Totally understand and don't and know that this you know doesn't have a lot of political. You're not going to win a lot of votes with, uh, with with this one, but it doesn't need to be complicated. And CIC can be helpful in you know, offering. We can all help the government and bureaucracy feel a bit safer in pursuing this. It's not a frivolous, uh, elitist uh, um, approach. And let's you know we can get into that because it drives me mad that this is seen as a, an, an elitist strategy. Um, but, and offer up ideas. Uh, I've, I've made a number of suggestions in the book from the, uh, an Order of Canada equivalent pin uh, to honor expats, to funding networks uh, around the world of expats, to bringing them back to Rideau Hall to uh, every couple of years, the best and the brightest of, uh, of them, maybe bring back you know, 50 interesting expats every other summer to sit down for a couple of days at Rideau Hall to uh, meet with not just the government leaders, but corporate leaders, academic leaders, uh, philanthropic leaders to tell us what we're not thinking about, uh, help us understand the world. What a, what a great gift. And then get them back out into the world, helping, helping us with, a, with a, a, a Canadian strategy. So CIC can be a really important um, part of that. But also, let's not just leave it up to government. Back to the premise of this being the age of networks. CIC is a fantastic network, and you are networked. You know this, but you probably don't even appreciate how deeply networked you are through all the people listening to all sorts of networks in the world. How do you get that uh, buzzing uh, a bit more for the benefit of, of Canada? How do you help companies uh, as well as um, nonprofit organizations and academic institutions use this people power, <laughs> to use a, a term from the 1980s. It is people power to advance our interests uh, as organizations in different parts of, uh, of, of the world. Well, it ties into uh, a question I have from Jennifer. And it's something you address in the book about universities. We bring loads of students here to Canada, but we have so few that actually go out. And so when, if we're trying to leverage universities and their alumni networks, it's difficult to do because we just don't seem to be that interested. So why is that? Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's probably uh, another book worth of research in there because Canadians, even though we, 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 we travel well and we mix in well in different cultures, as a percentage of the, the percentage of the population um, uh, that goes abroad is very small. Actually, the percentage of the population that leaves their own province is very small. Uh, so we're not a mobile people. We get too comfortable in our in, in our nests. And this is a this is a big challenge, I think, coming out of the uh, out of the pandemic, to find ways to get uh, the next generation of Canadians while they're in college and university to to get out to to study abroad or travel abroad or work abroad during during their uh, uh, post-secondary education there's lots of interesting work going on on that front progress is being made but it's nowhere near where uh, where it needs to be and one of the interesting ideas which I cite in the book from Roland Paris and Margaret Biggs uh, which uh, was starting to get traction just before the pandemic was maybe we need to fund Canadian students to go uh, abroad. I did a similar CIC talk with the Hamilton branch uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it was largely Brock and McMaster students. And they, um, the students said, look, we, we love what you're saying, want to do this, but we can't afford to have got student debts and don't have the cash flow to uh, survive very long after I get off an airplane. Understandable. So what, what are the financial mechanisms we need to develop to help, uh, help uh, address that challenge? I've got uh, uh, quite a few questions coming in, John. Some of them are small essays. So you are obviously inspiring some good conversation here and thoughts. Um, one thing that struck me uh, in the book, of course, is um, when you speak of like a Canadian diaspora overseas, we are such a diverse country to start with. 
And then the people that go overseas are also diverse. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I, I know Ruth is, uh, is an immigrant. Um, we go overseas and we don't naturally have connections. Let's say if you were coming from a more homogeneous country and you are here in Canada, uh, I remember my dad when he came joining the good old British Winnipeg club. But when mm. we go out into the world, people, like the folks you spoke to in London, they had, I mean, they were grouping together as Canadians, but they weren't even born in Canada. So how do you, you know, how do you, what is making Canadians like the group you were talking to in London actually come together at the end of the day? What's, yeah, the, Cana so what's the Canadianism thing? What's the, the, yeah, the, that's a, that's a profound question. What's the Canadian and or, uh, uh, in, in Canadian? Um, there is a sense. Uh, so, so I spent um, a, a long conversation and devoted chapter of the book to uh, a group of millennials in uh, London, almost all of whom were hyphenated Canadians: uh, Sudanese, Iranian, uh, Chinese, Indian, hyphen Canadian, even though they're they were born in Canada. And it hit me then and there. This is the future um, of, of, of Canadians abroad uh, because of the waves of, of immigration in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, really accelerating in the 80s and 90s, which led to, and, and the children born to that generation who moved here, millennials are now of post-secondary education and graduation age, and they're going out into the world. And they're going out into the world as a demographic, as a population that Canada, and frankly, I don't think the world has ever seen, of uh, being, uh, you know, I, I profile this one woman um, who was at Oxford. She's now in Stanford Medical School, Iranian-Canadian, grew up in Edmonton, uh, and there I am sitting down with her in London, England, along with a friend of hers, who is Sudanese Canadian, grew up in Scarborough, Ontario, uh, went to Google in Silicon Valley, then he's in, uh, also in Oxford. They both come down to London for, uh, for a chat. And this kind of hyphenated diaspora is to the world what immigration has become to Canada. And this is an additional strength that we have out in the world where we're going to have thousands and it's going to become hundreds of thousands of hyphenated Canadians <laughs> coming of age in the 2020s who are going to want to go out in the world, not necessarily back to their ancestral land. They just want to go out to wherever there's opportunity and excitement for them. But they get the world, and as I write in the world, because they look like the world. They are of the world. Mm -hmm. And that is a really, you know, that's a nice thing to say. That's a real strategic power for Canada because we need to stop saying, hey, you know, we're the place where immigration is friendly, we get immigration, we get multiculturalism, we're the nice place. Okay, that's all true. But we have to, in a subtle way, because we're only 40 million people, get out there into the world and say, look, hey world, you got serious problems and we actually can help solve them for you, like help you solve them. Um, China or India or Iran and this generation, is actually even better able to solve that than the Pearsonian generation because they are Canadian, they get mutual accommodation, they grew up in Canadian public schools, they get multiculturalism and bilingualism. But by definition, by that hyphen, um, which is what this young woman from Edmonton said, she said, I am not, she said, I am the hyphen. And I thought that is beautiful. So how do, how do we help the hyphen go out into the world and help the world become more hyphenated, which is yeah. a bridge. A hyphen is a bridge. And that's what Canada is so good at, at building bridges and helping other countries build bridges. We're good at that actually, literally, we're really good engineers, but I'm, I'm talking more culturally, politically, and socially and help this generation. I, I, I think it's a huge opportunity for us in the, in the years ahead. Yeah, you know, that came across pretty, pretty clear in, in the book. Um, because I was going to ask you, you know, do we have an international brand? That was one of the questions I had in my mind. And then I started reading your mm -hmm. book and you talk about Canada being an ethical superpower that comes up in your book and our best export being peace, order and good government, which I also mm -hmm. uh, re really like to, to see because uh, 
I think that's that is a, a, a quote export that we that we we can actually do. Um, one of the things I'd like to return to is you know you, there are issues. You know, Canada can catch up in some respects. So we need to catch up. Um, we have done. Uh, well, in some areas, I know there's big ex expat communities in Hong Kong that are are in some ways well uh, organized. Uh, perhaps some feel left out as well, but but we know that in Hong Kong and uh, you know there's a major Canadian population in, in Lebanon, uh, it, of course in the United States in the Silicon in Val Valley. You mentioned in the book about recognizing them. Rideau Hall, for example, could set up a unit to reach out to people. And I was wondering, would you see ever having a Ministry of Expat Affairs in government? Sure, it's worth uh, it's worth discussing. India has exactly that, uh, and and I saw this just starting to come to to be when I lived there. And in the twenty subsequent years, India has kind of written the playbook on diaspora strategy because they woke up and said, "Wow, we've got like the super diaspora." Uh, all over the world, and we don't need to uh, uh, hunt them down the way uh, authoritarian regimes do. Um, but we need them for our economic strategy. Other reasons too, but for economic strategy most of all. So they created a, 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 a unit within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like a sub-ministry, for overseas Indians. And they created, uh, there's a celebration every other year for overseas Indians. They bring back the best and the brightest and, get, and, and fed them and celebrate them uh, at Rashtrapati Bhavan, their equivalent of Rideau Hall. Um, they give special visa status to expats uh, and they give special status, I think this is such a clever idea, to the children of expats. So an Indian born in Canada, not an Indian, a, a Canadian born to Indian parents in Canada, has a special access right to access to a special visa to work or study in India because they wouldn't mind these this generation working in Mumbai or Delhi for uh, for a period and and why wouldn't those kids want that what a great opportunity once we're out of this pandemic so so strategic about this um, that's the Indian way of doing it they're India <laughs> we're Canada but how do we create sort of similar similarly spirited uh, approaches to get to work on this. You, um, I mentioned um, American Moxie, uh, which comes up in in your book, and and many Canadians heading to the United States and other countries because of the opportunities that are there. I got this feeling that there was something missing in Canada. Um, when you were researching the book, what what's wrong? What's wrong with us back here? I know that's a big question. What's wrong? Yeah. With us? Why are people? Why do people feel that they need to go? Oh yeah, that's a great great question. We're we're too comfortable, um, and it was Chamath Pulapatia, who, who's a uh, fairly well known venture capitalist, one of the early executives at Facebook. Uh, he took Facebook from kind of a small thing to a huge thing uh, before leaving. Uh, has you know, plenty enough money for uh, many times more people than him. And he's created a social capital fund in the Valley. And we spoke at length for the book. Um, and Chamath, um, his view was he had to leave. Um, born to Sri Lankan refugees, grew up above a laundromat in, in Ottawa, got a scholarship to University of Waterloo, engineering, hired into Silicon Valley, rest is history. But he said exactly what you just said. He said, I had to leave. I wouldn't be who I, he said, I am who I am because of Canada. I owe everything to Canada, to the public school system, to the welfare system that we lived on for a while, to the university system. Oh, oh all that, oh, oh, so much to Canada. But I couldn't have done this in Canada because I'm a bit of a rebel. Uh, I'm a misfit. And Canada is not good with misfits. Uh, we, we can conform a little too much. And the valley is full of, it's like the, 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 the valley is, is like the valley for misfit toys. It's, um, <laughs> it, you know, it's rebels. It's people like Elon Musk, another Canadian, who just couldn't fit in here. They were too ambitious, too disruptive, maybe too critical, too nonconformist. And I found that in expats around the world. 
They also, so we have to get better with misfits. We have to get better with people who, yeah, yeah, don't literally do, don't fit in. So that's okay. We kind of like that, that you don't fit in. And maybe you can kind of force us to change a little. Um, and we also have to be more demanding. And it was uh, Bob Bergino, the former president of the University of Toronto, who went, um, went, went to become president of, of Berkeley, who uh, had a great conversation with Bob at, at, at Berkeley. And he said, you know, Canada just doesn't have a culture of excellence. And he said, I discovered that, you know, he used to be at MIT, so he learned it there. But he said, you know, here at Berkeley, you know, if you are not a Nobel laureate, you haven't made it. <laughs> yeah. and literally outside Five parking office, spots. Outside his office were that, 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 that row of parking spots for Nobel laureate. And he said, that's just the American way. It is a, a higher standard and we need to enforce that a bit. And here's where I think expats can help us, but it, it's up to us. Many of them are, are critical politely, but critical of Canada for not being demanding enough, uh, whether it's in business, physics, the arts, banking. We just don't demand enough. We don't strive for that true gold medal of on planet earth we have to let them push us so you know literally call them up and say give us a kick and you know give us a kick in the rear end so that we can do better and I, I think that would be also you know what what can we do to help with this i think us probably being a little less um self-congratulatory of ourselves as a, a as a nation and not being self-loathing at the other extreme, but saying, hey, Canadian expats, give us a nudge, give us a kick. Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, so uh, this is a personal issue for me, John, I always, uh, the, the term middle power, I don't really like it. Uh, it, it it's, it's comfortable, uh, it, it's warm and it's fuzzy. But when I, when I look at, uh, when I do look at Canada, we, we do have the 10th largest economy in the world. And believe it or not, we spend the 15th highest on defense in the world. Um, some will, well, many of my friends will argue that it's not enough. Uh, we're a major mm. exporter of, of uh, natural resources. I mean, mm. we are a, a big player. And we're also very clever about going around the world and gathering up new immigrants as well. You know, if you look at yeah. the government's uh, new numbers are, you know, over the next three years, 400,000 a year. Um, does it, I, sometimes I think it's in our best interest maybe to play this stealthy, stealthy role and not advertise our, ourselves too much as we go about our business quite cleverly. But this is, yeah, that, and that's the small power thinking. And, and this is where expats can help, where we can just quietly, you know, they're not going to march in the streets of whatever, waving Canadian flags. Uh, that would be preposterous, and they're the, they'd be the first to say that. But to help us quietly, um, when there are diplomatic challenges, one of the things I learned in my time in India was the power of, um, of two-track diplomacy. Because India and Pakistan, these are countries that are on the verge of nuclear war all the time, including when I was there, they were detonating nuclear uh, devices. But even in the darkest moments, they, do, they, they try to invest in, in the second track, people-to-people -people diplomacy. It's an academics, business people, um, scientists, cross-border, get to know each other, uh, and knowing that they would go back and say to the government, you know, the Pakistanis are not as crazy as you say in public. And here's what they're, here's what the people are thinking. Uh, and we need to take a signal from that and say, how do we have this two track? So when we have challenges with a China, for instance, there's lots of Canadians in China, Hong Kong, as we know, continuing to do incredible work. Rafer Wallace, I profile in the book, one of Can uh, China's leading green architects and pioneers in building materials. Rafer McGill grad, 2001, graduated, wanted to go to the most exciting place on earth, got on a plane and went to Shanghai, didn't know anyone there, got hired by a Chinese architecture firm that said, your first assignment, build a suburb. And he said, well, who's going to be my leader on the project? They said, you're the leader of the mm -hmm. project. You're Canadian. You know how to make good buildings. <laughs> 20 years later, Rafer is making really good buildings, 
but he's created a company that's uh, like the Google of building materials that's based in Shanghai, that has a tech operation in Quebec City, a sales office in Chicago, Illinois, and is, is a multinational. Rafer's doing better than ever. He told me recently his relations with Chinese authorities are better than ever as a Canadian, and he's very proud of being Canadian. Um, we need people like Rafer developing the second track, helping the Chinese understand, you know, Canada and China will have an ongoing and ultimately good relationship. Uh, but we got, yeah, we got other things to, to work out. I'm not I'm downplaying those at all, but you can have the two tracks. Same in Saudi Arabia, one of, you know, at, at the height of the crisis um, uh, a couple of years ago, someone told me, you know, in Saudi Aramco, world's biggest oil company, guess which country has the biggest uh, number of expats in Saudi Aramco? Mm. Said, you're kidding me. But no. Yeah. <laughs> no. I'm not surprised. Are we, are we using them? No. Do we know who they are? No. You know, are, are they going to get people out of jail? No. But can they form a second track so that the Saudis continue to think positively, even when they're angry at the government of Canada? They are not angry at the people of Canada. That is the power of, of, of people diplomacy where experts can play such a, such a good role. Yeah, you, you know, uh, two years ago, I was in uh, Qatar and mm. uh, on an official, uh, a, a semi-official visit to Al Jazeera and I kept running into Canadians uh, in pretty senior positions and it just yes. blew my mind. I mean, oh, you're from Canada. Oh, you're from Canada. Uh, one thing your book did for me, though, I, it set me running to Wikipedia on numerous occasions because I couldn't believe, for example, that Elon Musk was Canadian. Of course, he was born in South Africa, but his mom's from Saskatchewan. Yeah. Thought, oh, wow. This is amazing. Went to Queens. <laughs> I went to Queens. That's right. Um, one of the questions I have um, that came in from uh, from Kim, and it's I'm kind of I, I, I'm going to blend it a little bit with some other stuff. Um, we have things going on in the world right now, COVID, and, and there are trade wars. And it's been pretty grim over the last four years. Do you think post-COVID that the uh, Canadian communities around the world will potentially be, be drawn closer together? Do you, do you get a sense of that? Have you heard much about that? Yeah, I, th I, th I think coming out of this crisis, we're going to see more nationalism in the in the world. That is evident, and therefore... Canadians may want to, of Canadians abroad may want to identify um, with their own country a bit more, not in a jingoistic way, but just to um, have a sense of belonging. I think this this crisis has has created a bit of a crisis of belonging in the world as we uh, as we isolate, uh, and that can be an advantage as we come uh, come out of it. Secondly, we are going to have a more digitally wired and networked world than we could have even imagined 12 months ago, uh, 12 months from now. Uh, the amount of development that's gone on in cloud computing, in, in computing power over the last 10 months, huge, and that's all going to continue. So how do we seize on that? How do we seize on the natural comfort? Like what we're doing right now, 10 months ago would have been weird. Mm -hmm. It's not weird today. This is pretty normal. Is it optimal? No. You know, it would be nice for us to do this together one day. But this sort of thing is is, is still there. So how do we do it? Um, one of the examples I, I wanted to mention is um, the, the, the Team Canada idea. When I was living abroad in the 1990s, Jean Chrétien was you know, doing the, the Team Canada uh, tours. And they were really effective. I mean, I, I was a journalist and a bit cynical about them, but you know what? They had an impact. And I was in those countries long after Team Canada went home and would meet not just government people, but business leaders or others who would say, yeah, I was there when all those Canadians came. And you know, I have, now have a much better appreciation of your country. How do we take that spirit of Team Canada and the power of the digital platforms, including the one that we're using now, to better connect with the world? To, you know, let's just I'm making this up uh, right now, but to have the Prime Minister have a Team Canada Zoom day in uh, Qatar with mm -hmm. the Canadians there 
and you know people of influence in Qatar, Qatar I think it's pronounced, to um, talk about Canadian interests or in Dubai or Delhi or wherever, and just say, Mr. Prime Minister, please just you know devote two hours of your day to this, and wouldn't that you know Canadian expats would of course sign up for that, and people mm-hmm. of influence in those 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 communities would sign up for it, and then leave it to them to take take advantage of, of of that. So I think we 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 can create a more dynamic future if we want to. I know we only have a few minutes left, uh, but I've never been bombarded with this many questions before. One uh, question that I did have, you know, is, is Canadians coming back, uh, mm. coming back here? And one of the folks here has said, you know, I've come back and I've got all this great experience, but it doesn't seem to count for much. Is this a common story? Yes. Oh my Lord, it's a common story. And it it's so painful, so painful. A very prominent person in the Canadian government, when he saw my book and read it, sent me an email and, and um, said, let me share you a story. I, I spent a number of years in, in, in Asia. I came back and I was told, we can't hire you. Uh, he's since gone on to, to sig- significant work. We can't hire you because you don't have Canadian experience. And we don't think you'll, you'll understand what we do. And I just, I, I've heard that over and over again. I don't know what it is about us that does not see international experience as a 2x or 10x value to the equivalent in, in Canada. When I hire, I try to include always the question in interviews, tell me about your international experience. And if you don't have any, I would like to understand why. Um, because it tells me about your your character, your your gumption, your get up and go, but also what you've learned elsewhere. And it's not a specific skill, it's an attitude. And another returnee I was talking to recently was, was, was sharing the same frustration. And she's got a great job. Her husband has a significant job leading a multinational in Canada. And he said, people in my work, People don't value it. No one ever calls me up to say, help us understand this strategic situation that we're up against. So that's, while we have this opportunity with expats abroad, we have this challenge at home. But just to wrap up on this point, others have suggested to me, okay, you talk about global networks kind of starting at the border. Why aren't you thinking about this, John, as global networks integrating with Canadian networks? works. So these networks of returnees, if I, if I can call them that, maybe we can help them uh, or maybe they can help the Canadian government or the CIC or GAC or whoever connect with global networks because they think different differently. So mm-hmm. just an idea to throw out there. If, if, if people on the call want to run with that, let's, um, let's do it. Well, based on the number of questions and what uh, and Roger's earlier question, I, I think there is a lot of interest in this uh, subject. And I do know we have just two minutes left on the clock. It's been a very fast hour, but this has been very useful because we do have, uh, CIC does have its um, foreign policy by Canadians uh, initiative underway, supported by Robert Greenhill uh, with Global Canada and Can Watch as well. And we're going to be bringing together virtually 400 Canadians in February. It'll be the largest deliberative democracy exercise ever held in the country to talk about um, important issues, global health, climate change, uh, security issues, the economy and so forth. And I think um, what you've discussed today is, is it has to be worked into that discussion about mm-hmm. uh, how are we going to make a difference uh, at home, yes, but in the world. And so uh, for us, it's been, it, it, it's been quite useful. And I'm quite inspired now to want to take some of the stuff we've been talking about and bring it into the discussions we'll be having. Um, we have a minute to go. So, so I had more questions for you, uh, John, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, I'd like to thank you for spending the time with us today. Is there anything you'd like to to close on? Yeah, ne- uh, <laughs> it's Christmas. I, I'm gonna hold up the book just because you know, I've got to help my, my, my publisher. Um, 
but I'll just I'll, I'll tell you a little story. But I love this design of the mm -hmm. uh, the goose taking off. And we had in the initial design there was a red suitcase there, um, which I I'm still torn. Maybe it would have been better with the red suitcase. But I but I I didn't want the book to look like a travel book or to suggest that. This was about you know Canadians just taking a suitcase. This is about Canadians, yes, who have left but are settled somewhere. But yeah. you know, if, if people think the suitcase would be better, let me know. And maybe for the uh, paper paperback, if we do a paperback, we can get the uh, the, the the suitcase back uh, in there. But uh, no, thank th thank you so much for uh, the, the the conversation and the interest. I, I'm I'm really delighted. By the amount of interest I'm getting in the in in the book, I'm doing this, these sorts of conversations on an almost daily basis uh, with groups across Canada, but groups around the world uh, in 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 the Middle East, in the in in East Asia, in Europe, in the in the U.S. Um, and we have a bit of a moment here that we can we can seize on. And I, I was so delighted. I'll just wrap up with this point with an email I got out of the blue from a student at um, Queen's University who said, that book is about me. He said, I grew up in Houston. I'm Canadian born, father went to work for an oil, oil company. He goes, and all I hang out with on campus here are hyphenated Canadians who have come from Malaysia, from India, from Europe, back to their home country or their parents' country to, to study. And they're gonna go back out into the world what an opportunity for us as a country that we are not just the place that people, you know, not the destination. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not just a destination, I'm sorry, but also a platform for this new generation to then go back out into the world and take us into, uh, into a future that's going to need Canada. Um, but it's, it's, it's a bigger, more divided world. So it's going to need a different kind of Canada. And I think our, our expats can, uh, can help take us there. Well, John, thank you. And I had a note here circled, mention Christmas and the book. So I'm glad you <laughs> were able to hold up a copy. Uh, it's a great book and I, I highly recommend it. So uh, yes, and if you that, want to order, go to, uh, of course, Amazon and oh. Indigo. Um, but, but also, if you want to support your local bookseller, please uh, do that. You can go to Penguin Random House. Uh, there's a page, just search Penguin Random House and John Stack House or Planet Canada. We have a landing page for the book, and there's some um, buttons there that will take you to uh, to the um, um, to the uh, e-commerce pages for uh, for various book uh, booksellers. So, um, great your choice, but uh, would love to see the message get uh, love to see the the conversation grow. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, wherever you are, have a good day, good evening, and uh, and good night. Take care. Great. Thank you so much. Bye Good night. Bye.